Forgive me if my voice shakes. Forgive me if my heart breaks. Forgive me for asking for forgiveness, but it seems that people like me have to apologize just to breathe. My name is Moisés Serrano, and, I'm un- and I am undocumented, and I am queer, and I am Mexican. And chances are, most of you are not undocumented, or queer, or Mexican, and I know for a fact that most of you are not Moisés Serrano. <laughs> so it seems that as of now, we may not have very many things in common, but here is one experience which, he, which we have all longed for. You see, my whole life I've been oscillating between two points. Dancing between Mexican and American, brown and white, gay and straight, love and hate. And I've never found a home. My whole life I've always wanted to be loved and accepted. And so have you. I migrated with my parents when I was 18 months old from Mexico to the fields in North Carolina. My parents picked tobacco and other seasonal produce. And later my mother would find work at a chicken house and I remember the trucks pulling in every year bringing in baby chicks and I would play with them along with the granddaughter of the owners who showed my family true compassion and kindness. And they are the South that I know, they are the South that I remember. I also grew up listening to the great pop bands of the 90s, TLC. And I used to sing, don't go, Jason Waterfalls. (laughs) I didn't understand why Jason was always leaving. It was sad, sad times. But I also remember growing up and being enchanted by the Statue of Liberty, being enchanted by what she represented. She was a beacon of hope to immigrants, and I knew that she was a welcome sign to myself and to my family, and I felt special. I felt proud. Later in life, I would become perplexed when I saw that my nation actively preached xenophilia, right? The the act of love of immigrants and its immigrant roots, but also actively practice xenophobia. And I wondered if they were interconnected. I started Star Mountain High School in 2003, and there I not only had to face the normal challenges and obstacles that a normal pubescent teenager goes through, but I was also keeping dark secrets which I had hoped no one would ever find out. My algebra teacher my sophomore year had innocently asked the class for their social security numbers. And as everyone was sharing their numbers out loud, which right now does not seem like a good idea, (laughs) but everyone was sharing their numbers out loud and I just bowed my head and I practiced my test and I pretended not to hear the conversation as my heart raced because I knew that I didn't have one and I wondered what they would do if they were to find out. That same year, my best friend that, that I had known since fourth grade had decided to climb the social ladder and make me the target of his attacks. One day as we were switching classes and it seemed like the whole high school emptied out into the courtyard. As I approached him, he yelled, look at that faggot walking right there. My world froze. I didn't know what to do. I could feel my face turn a burning red. And I could feel my ears burning as I quickly walked away. I graduated high school in 2007, and what was supposed to be one of the happiest moments of my life What was supposed to mark the beginning of my adulthood, mark the beginning of my career, was actually the beginning of my American nightmare. You see, in 2007, the community college system had flat out barred all undocumented students like myself from even attending a community college campus or a public university. 
my dream of going to Chapel Hill and studying journalism was dead. From 2007 until 2010, I actively worked in factories, vineyards, or as an electrician with my father just to make a living. People oftentimes forget that one of the worst hit people in our nation by the economic recession were migrant communities, and it took all four of us living under one roof to make a living. My last job in 2010 at a factory was working from 7 at night to 7 in the morning. And just like that courtyard, that factory put fear and terror into my everyday life, not only because I could be stopped on my way there for driving without a driver's license, but because I knew I could see the way the other men looked at me. The whispers, the chatters behind my back, I knew what they were saying. There were no safe spaces for people like me. Not at school, not at work, and sometimes not even at home. One morning I was exhausted and I asked myself, is this it? Is this life? If it is, I don't want it. I don't. There was a bottle of sleeping pills standing on my nightstand. And I wondered, what were to happen if I were to take these? Would anyone even care? Would my friends even notice? And I thought, <laughs> of course they wouldn't. For the last three years, they've been actively pursuing their dreams and they forgot about you. The only people which I knew since my childhood had abandoned me. And here I was again without a family. So as I prepared my cup of water and I stared at those sleeping pills in my hand, I thought, is this it? Is this the end of Moises? But I knew that it wasn't. This couldn't be. There was so much love inside of me and so much more that I had to offer to my family, my community, and my country. And so I put that bottle of sleeping pills down and I went to sleep. Later that year, I came out in 2010 publicly for the first time as, un as undocumented and unafraid. For the next four years, from 2010 until 2014, I fought tirelessly for my migrant community and shared my story in every corner of the state, quickly becoming one of the most requested speakers of any social justice issue in my state. But it wasn't enough. I had a dream. And that dream was to go to college, and it was being denied every single day. Little did I know that immigrant rights activism actually put me on a pathway towards an education. In the movement I met, in the movement I met my friend, Maida, who told me about Sarah Lawrence. And she said that they were actively accepting undocumented students because it was a private university and that they were giving financial aid. I put off the application to the very last day. I thought, no, I'm not going to get in. Nothing good has ever happened to me. Why would it happen now? But at the last minute I, I did, I sent it in and I stalked the mailman for the next two months. <laughs> but one day I finally got a package and it was from Sarah Lawrence, and I opened it. I opened the letter, and it said, congratulations on becoming the Sarah Lawrence College class of 2018. It was one of the happiest moments of my life until I saw the financial aid packet. Sarah Lawrence carries a price tag of $65,000 a year. They were leaving me with to pay around 30000 a year, and there was absolutely no way that I was going to have that money or to make it. Here I was again, the death of my American dream. But what I learned in activism and working in the immigration movement is that if there's an obstacle, there's also a way. 
So I appealed the, fi the financial aid decision, and I submitted letters of support from leaders across the state, which I had worked with for the past four years, stating why I deserved more financial aid. I even submitted a letter, a handwritten letter from my mother explaining why her son should go to college. So I waited yet again, this time with a little bit of wine. I finally received an email notification saying my financial aid status had been changed. I didn't want to open it. I was so scared, but I did. And it said, your outstanding community service work and your dedication to your community has led us to revise your financial aid package. And I didn't know if I was reading this right, but they were going to cover over 99% of my costs for the next four years. <laughs> it was one of the happiest moments of my life. It seems like I had found finally my place. But I know that I am the exception. I know that my story is not the common story, that there are approximately 2.1 million undocumented students just like myself who do not have a pathway towards an education today in this country. I share my story today not for, for myself, but for you. Because I know that we can do better. I know we can do better. Because I believe in you. And I know we can do better as a community and as a country. Paolo Frieri in Pedagogy of the Oppressed believes that the oppressed must not only liberate themselves, but they must liberate their oppressors. That the oppressed, to be oppressed, is unnatural, but also to oppress is equally as unnatural. And we must all recognize that we are all oppressors to some degree. The moment that the oppressors choose materialistic ambition over humanity, love, and compassion, they no longer are. They just have. He also writes that liberation is a childbirth, one that is painful but that we must all go through. And here's something that I want to add. I don't believe that there is only one childbirth or two in our lives. I understand that nobody is perfect, but we must go through consistent stages of rebirth if we are going to stand in true solidarity with our neighbors and welcome them and love them. Maybe only then will we stop to see people as an exploitable labor force instead of the beautiful, talented, capable human beings that they are. My name is Moises Serrano, and I am undocumented, I am queer, and I am unashamed. But I am only one of, ele of 11 million undocumented individuals in this nation. And today I ask of you, Will you help me build my home? Thank you.